Hey, welcome everybody, Recovery Guy, back here with another video featuring the whiteboard. Obviously, there's a ton of stuff going on right here. Um, this is actually a very special group. This one has taken me a really long time to compile, but and it's quite complicated, so I hope you guys can stick with me, but it answers a couple really, really important questions. One of them is, I guess, is the law of attraction real? If so, how does it actually work? Like, what's the mechanism there? Also, what is prayer? Is it real? Does it work? Again, what's the mechanism there? And then also, step 11. Now, we all know step 11 is real. We all know step 11 works. But how does it work? We're going to answer all these questions and more coming up on this episode of The Recovery Guy. All right, you guys, let's get into this. Now, I want to preface this uh, group, if you want to call it that, by just saying that you guys don't necessarily need to know this stuff in order to get sober. Now, I'm one of those guys who likes to question everything and like find out why things work. I have a little bit of a, a scientific mind in that respect. So, you know, for me, in order to really take the plunge into doing something like the steps or even believing something kind of ridiculous like the law of attraction, I'm sorry to any law of attraction people out there, it's kind of ridiculous, it's kind of weird. I personally believe in it, maybe not for the exact reasons that most people do, but, you know, uh, even though I believe in it, I am able to kind of look at it from a broader perspective and understand that it does seem like magic and, you know, magic doesn't exist and all that kind of stuff. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is obviously one of the most interesting subjects of all time, and that is consciousness. If you guys are an Alan Watts fan, if you're a Deepak Chopra fan even, an Eckhart Tolle fan, if you guys like Erich Neumann, if you like Carl Jung, Jordan Peterson, all these guys, one of their favorite topics is always consciousness. Um, what is consciousness? Well, if you want to get real simple about it, it's just the ability that humans have to be aware of everything. So I'm aware of Dylan right now filming this video from the corner. I'm aware of what I'm wearing, how I'm feeling. Um, it is essentially the host of all experience. All the smells I will ever smell, all the tastes I will ever taste, the, the, the sights and the sounds that I will ever experience all happen to me within this kind of field of awareness that I have. And, you know, it's, 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 it's not only uh, like a, a quantitative thing, consciousness, it's also a qualitative thing. Like, uh, you know, you see animals like doing various things and, you know, like you see things like squirrels and they're saving nuts up for the winter time and stuff like that. And you could say like, yeah, they're conscious of what's going on. They, they know what they're doing, but like, I, I wouldn't be so sure about that. You know, most animals and especially like lizards to a lesser extent dogs, they don't really seem to be consciously aware of what they're doing and they lack the quality of understanding when they're going about their, their daily duties. So, you know, consciousness is a really weird thing because you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it, but without it, there would be none of those things. So essentially, all everything you guys will ever know, all your thoughts, every experience you will ever have is occurring within your consciousness. And the weird part about consciousness, though, is that like the bandwidth is severely limited. The human body, the brain essentially is producing or actually processing something like 400 billion bits of information per second. The bandwidth of consciousness is actually about 2000 bits per second. So, you know, 99.999999% of everything that's going on, even in my immediate environment, is happening outside the scope of my consciousness. And therefore, in effect, it is not real to me. Um, you know, even things like I have a hundred million, I have a hundred billion neurons right now in my brain firing along a hundred trillion potential neural pathways. Uh, thalamic neurons will fire, you know, sometimes like eight times a second. Uh, cortical neurons can fire up to 800 times per second. Uh, roughly average two to 300 times per second. So I have a hundred billion neurons firing at two to 300 times per second all the time. I'm not aware of any of that. I'm not aware of what my immune system is doing. You guys get the point. We're only aware of the smallest a fraction of what reality has to offer us, okay? So that's it for consciousness for now. Again, it is the host of all experience. If you're not conscious of it, effectively, it's not real, okay? Now, again, new concept. So we gotta talk about time, aim, true, and sin. Okay, what we need to know about time is that you can only go in one direction in time. Human beings are ballistic creatures. We are always moving forward in time. Uh, we can't move backwards. Okay, 
Now, then it becomes like, where are we going to? So if we're always moving forward in time, like where are we going? Well, we should at least have an aim. Um, you know, if you don't have an aim, people will call you aimless. People will call you directionless. You'll lack a sense of purpose. It's not, it's derogatory to not have an aim. So not only are we moving forward like an arrow, we are also moving forward at a destination. Now, if we don't have a destination, usually that's bad for a human being's mental health. True. We got to talk a little bit about the word truth and what it means. You know, I take a little bit more of a pragmatic view on what true is. And I think, you know, effectively what is true to us is depending on accuracy. Again, back to the arrow analogy, the arrow flies true, the fastest, quickest, most effective way to hit your aim. And then we also got to define sin and sin is actually originally an archery term and it's to miss your mark. So we got time. You're always moving forward aim. You need an aim. If you want to be a successful human being, your aim must be true. And sin is to miss the mark of your aim. Now, what aim are we going towards? This is something that we got to ask ourselves. Cause I don't know if we, you know, human beings like to consciously set our goals like that. You know, lots of things can set our goals for us. Like, you know, all of a sudden if my tummy rumbles and I feel hungry, like my goal is going to be switched from doing this video to like, I got to go get something to eat. Or if I feel I have to go to the bathroom now, my goal isn't like, Hey, what are we, you know, what are we going to have to eat? It's going to be to go to the bathroom. Uh, I'm going to be switched in and out of varying goal systems, but let's describe the way that the goal systems work for a second. I got it kind of written down over here. Um, essentially it's like, we need to, you know, because we are always moving forward and because we need an aim, we're always like setting these little goals, either consciously or unconsciously. I would say for us, drug addicts and alcoholics, mostly these goals are being set unconsciously. And roughly our goal is always the same. And it's something like happy or the perfect life or heaven or the promised land. We're always kind of going for that. Now, we all have our various kind of conceptions as to what that life will look like somebody it's just like i have a train car full of heroin enough to last me the rest of my life and i'm just always fucking partying and some people it's like i want the wife and the kids like we all go some of us want to be super rich and famous and be flying around all over the world doing cool stuff we all have a different definition of what we think will make us happy but the weird part of it is that like happiness is usually the goal now here's the thing about the goal system and when, when we're talking about like emotions is that your emotions are actually progress trackers. So all po like positive emotion and negative emotion, they're essentially things that help us reach our goal. Um, now, you know, my version of happiness, this is, you know, sorry, ladies, this is kind of like a bro version of happiness. It's like gym tan laundry. You got to get jacked. You got to get a nice tan on. You got to get your nice fresh clothes right out of the laundry. You get into a relationship, you get a bunch of money, and that's basically the perfect life. Now, your emotions are going to track your progress towards the goal. If you experience gains at the gym, you are going to be incredibly happy, and you're going to look at yourself in the mirror, and you're going to go in a public washroom for some reason and take selfies with your shirt off and post it all over Facebook. I have no idea why people do this or how they can think that people actually like that or that it's classy. So if you're doing it, please stop doing it. But if you don't stop doing it that's okay too it's your funeral anyways so now if you're going to the gym and you're not experienced gains obviously that's going to give you a tremendous amount of negative emotion so like i'm going to skip these two for now because they're mostly just kind of a joke but you know in relationships it's like when you're interested in someone romantically and they show any interest towards you it makes our heart leap for joy we're really really happy or if like your current girlfriend or your current boyfriend is happy with you and they're showering you with affection or there's signs that the relationship is going well or, you know, or you're progressing towards that goal of getting into a relationship, you would get, you get flooded with positive emotion. Same with money. If there's money on the horizon, if you sense that you're about to get a raise, if you sense that you're going to go to the casino later and gamble and you're usually good at gambling, or there's something that leads you to believe that there's money on the horizon, you guys get really, really happy about that. And obviously the opposite, if, if that, if that person doesn't smile back at you or they don't want to give you their phone number, like it hits us really hard and it makes us feel bad. Um, I don't need to get into specifics. Just the point is that your emotions will track your progress towards the goal. And here's the problem with the goal system. Now, first, firstly, they're subject to the law of diminishing returns. So the perfect life, um, when you are just fresh off a horrible relapse and everything sucks and everybody's mad at you and you feel like shit and you're wired to whatever you're wired to, you're getting DTs and stuff like that. 
the gains in your well-being are very, very rapid at the beginning because first you get a couple sleeps, you feel better, and then, you know, you're able to get down more food and sleep better. So, you, you, you know, your physical self is feeling better at a kind of a rapid rate and then you maybe get a job and then, you know, everyone starts cheering you on. Oh, you're doing so well now. And then, but you know, it's subject to the law of diminishing returns. As you get closer to that vision of a perfect life, those incremental gains and in well-being become extremely few and far in between. And uh, we're not kind of making progress towards our goal in as rapidly as we did at the very beginning. And then, you know, effectively what that means is we're not experiencing as much positive emotion now as we were before. And, you know, that's why, you know, I get a lot of guys coming up to me saying like, oh, you know, I've plateaued in my recovery. I'm at a standstill in my recovery. And these fucking guys only have, you know, in between two weeks and three months sober. Like I have no idea why in something like recovery, which is a lifelong journey, you could possibly plateau in two to three weeks. But, you know, it's the feeling that you get when you're in between these little micro goals on the way to your, uh, on the way to your macro goal. Now, what happens is when we actually achieve the goal, and let me grab my eraser, once we achieve the goal, so like, you know, she does smile at me, oh, she does want to give me her phone number, oh, we do go on a date, oh, things are getting serious, and I achieve, let's just say, relationship status, what happens is that goal has been achieved, and now, the goal system crumbles. Now all the positive emotion that I was mining out of that resource is kaput. Same with this goal. And when I finally reach my goal, it's always next, 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 next. As soon like, you know, I want a million dollars. I will work my ass off. I will get a million dollars. I will immediately not be happy with it. And I will have to shoot for two million and then 10 million and then a hundred million because we're never satisfied. And that's where the saying, the, the journey is more important than the destination is like when you're currently on the way to achieving a goal, you're experiencing a lot of positive emotion. But when you achieve the goal, it's like now that's over. So you have to move on to the next one. So it is important to choose a long-term sustainable goal that will continually provide you with gain over a very, very long time span. I mean, we live 80 years, so it's like we need something that's really going to stand the test of time. Things like guitar, sports, you can never be too good at those things. Okay, I hope you guys are still with me. I'm going somewhere with this thing. Now, I want to ask you guys a, a, an important question. Like, you know, usually I'm doing group and there's a bunch of guys in this room and I kind of get them all to close their eyes and I get them to answer me a question like first I'll say like what color are my shoes and you know some most people can get that I usually wear black shoes dress shoes and then I you know ask them like more complicated questions like what are the patterns on my shirt how many pictures are on the wall what shoes is this guy in my group wearing what shoes is that guy in my group wearing and people have all these kind of wild answers and wacky answers and then I get them all to open my eyes and and I and then they realize that they are basically wrong about everything and they have no idea how many pictures are on the walls and they have no idea what patterns on my shirt. And, you know, I often bring to their attention the fact that we're in this room with each other for like six hours a day, five days a week for weeks and weeks. And the fact that they don't know how much picture, how many pictures are on the wall, like shows a fairly appalling lack of like situational awareness. But it's actually quite common. Again, back to consciousness, we're only aware of a very, very small fraction of what's actually going on in this world. Now, then, then that kind of leads to the question, it's like, why, do we, why are we conscious of certain things? And why are we not conscious of certain things? Like, why can people tell me what color shoes I'm wearing, but they can't tell me how many pictures are on the wall? How can some of my guys recite back to me almost entire groups that I do for them, but they can't actually guess the amount of pictures? on? Like what determines what you get to be consciously aware of or not? What determines the contents of your consciousness? And again, it's a very narrow bandwidth. It's only about, you know, 0.00001% of the information that you're processing. So consciousness is basically split into two things. We got threats or problems and we got tools. What we're aware of are things that threaten us and things that help us. Problems or tools, good or bad effectively. But then you got to ask yourself, well, what determines what we think is good or bad? Well, well, let's go back to the goal system. It depends on whatever your current goal is at the time. If I'm walking by the bathroom door, and I don't have to go to the bathroom and I'm just on my way out back, I don't even notice the bathroom. I couldn't tell you if the door was open or closed. Maybe sometimes I can, but you know, 
if you play the odds out, most of the times I would probably get something like that wrong. It's not something that pops into my awareness. There's The bathroom is meaningless to me. It means nothing to me. And I'm not going to experience any kind of good or bad emotion from walking by that bathroom, or I'm not even going to really know if the door was open or closed. Now, if I actually have to go to the bathroom, and that's a goal that I have, all of a sudden that bathroom door being open or closed is going to manifest itself to me in my field of awareness. And depending on whether the door is open or closed, I will experience a significant amount of motion, either positive or negative. If I I really have to go to the bathroom. Obviously negative if someone's in the bathroom, positive if the bathroom door is open. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. Okay. We got like 87 guys at the compound here. It's, you know, rough, rough going when you got to use the bathroom sometimes. So now we're starting to get somewhere. Now, now we're starting to tie together some, some concepts. You know, what appears to you in your field of awareness and what gives you positive or negative emotion is essentially based on goals. It's based on your aim. It's based on your destination. Okay. So now we get into something like sub personalities and you know, lots of times I call these things possessions. Um, these can be personality traits that you happen to exhibit, or these can be kind of emotions. You know, when, I don't know if you, when's the last time you guys were really, really angry at someone. Uh, it kind of reminds me of that Snickers commercial where that guy turns into Joe Pesci and then they give him a Snickers and he turns back into himself and they're like, you're not yourself when you're hungry. Because what happens when we're experiencing like, let's just say a bout of rage or someone really pisses us off is like this kind of mentality that comes over us and it takes over our bodies. And we're not thinking of anything else. We're not thinking of the bathroom door anymore. We're not thinking about whether we're hungry or not. We have a new goal. And the goal is basically the person who pissed us off will manifest themselves to us in our field of awareness that is consciousness as a threat. And now our goal system switches. And that goal is essentially to kill the threat. And to different people, the threat can mean different things. To, uh, to me, it's like someone is challenging my authority. Let's just say in group, he's like, I don't agree with what you have to say. I think the steps are stupid. I happen to take offense to that. Now my authority is in question. My ability to do my job is under question. And now it's kind of like, I want to prove to this guy that the steps are real and that they do work. So now kind of it shifts my perceptual framework to like things that will help me explain this to him and things that will stop me from explaining this to him. So based on, you know, some random guy saying something, it's going to shift my perceptual framework. It's going to shift my goal system and it's going to shift my emotional framework as well. So now we're starting to get into the realm where, where goals will dictate your emotions and they will dictate what you see and what you don't see. What kind of sliver or chunk of the world manifests itself to you and, you know, what joins almost everything in the irrelevancy because you know at any given day most things are completely irrelevant to us you know there's a lot of detail in this hardwood floor here i wouldn't be able to map it out or draw a picture of it at all because it's just not important to me it's not relevant so it's hiding there now i'm going to make the claim that your guys's biggest problem and the solutions to your problems are currently hiding in the irrelevancy and they need to be effectively pulled from the irrelevancy into your conscious awareness. Not only do you need to pull them out and become aware of them, you also need the right things to manifest themselves as a positive emotion to you and the raw and the, the right wrong things and manifest themselves to you as a negative emotion, you know, and you know, here's how I'm going to tie this all together. Most of us, our goal is happy. Okay. So if you're a drug addict, your primary goal is like, how do I like not feel bad about anything? How do I maximize the amount of time I spend in positive emotion? It's all about our feelings. We're way too concentrated on our feelings at any given time. Oh, this is upsetting to me. I have to run away from it or I have to kill the threat. Like we have, we always have to do something to make ourselves into a positive state. And like ultimately that will logically lead us to drugs every time. Happiness as a goal is not a very good goal. Now, back to true and sin. Reaching your aim, not reaching your aim. What you guys think is true is also a manifestation of your goal system. If your goal is just to be happy, yeah, a bunch of cocaine and a bunch of, you know, parties and people that have money and like flashy stuff, that's going to manifest themselves to you as good. You know, you know, you really think that doing steroids is honestly going to help you get sober? Yes, I 100% do. That's true. 
And you'll have all these post hoc reasons why, because it makes me feel confident, it makes me look good, people respect me more, I can do better at my job when I'm confident, and they all have all these like decently pseudo reasonable kind of explanations as to why steroids are good. But I don't think steroids are good for people at all, because, and the only reason that steroids manifest them to them as something that is true and will help them is because their goal isn't in the right spot. Their aim is off. It's a sin. They're going for happiness. They're going to coddle their emotional nature. Their emotional nature nature is so important to them that they will do anything to try and keep it at a certain level and they will justify any action they deem necessary to reaching that goal and those things will all be true so like again i i'm sorry if i'm if i'm not explaining myself property properly but what we got here is that what is true and false to you will spring up in relation to a goal your perceptual framework will spring up to you in relation to a goal and your emotional framework will spring up to you in relation to a goal. So whatever your guys' destination, we're moving forwards through time, we have an aim, wherever you're going determines everything about your life, true and false, positive and negative, good and bad emotions, and your perce- your actual perceptions will be geared towards this. So it's like, you know, I find most of the time my goals are set subconsciously based on my belief system. Someone, you know, someone makes me lose face in group or, or on the street or, you know, or I'm watching a movie, Wolf of Wall Street, and I'm like, why don't I have a bunch of fancy cars and, you know, girls running around and a bunch of drugs, like a, a bunch of money? Why don't I? And that kind of stuff sets my goals. And I'm being pulled into these various goal systems by like external elements like beyond my control and I don't even know that I'm doing this because I'm only conscious of the things that help me get there and that's so real to me and pursuing these like false idols I guess you could call them not to be all religious and shit but they they drive me to action so it's like you know when when I was in a treatment center myself when I was a client at a treatment center we had a lot of guys who would on a Friday night they would all get together and they would go down to uh you know the party district of Vancouver and they would literally just walk up and down the street where all the bars were and they were like oh man you see that girl she looked at you and like oh man that guy tried to fight you you would have kicked his ass and like, oh man that girl it's like And I'm wondering like what, you know, not to be super hard, like what the fuck is wrong with these people? We're in treatment. We have a life threatening illness. And what they want to do on a Friday night is to like go down, walk up and down a treat street and and what, try and get laid in a, like, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, they're obviously not actually into recovery. They're just trying to get happy. They're not trying to get a sustainable recovery going for themselves they're just simply trying to temporarily make themselves feel better so what is the goal that's kind of the question like what is a goal what is an aim that is true what is the direction that we should be heading that the that brings into alignment all these forces that the things that are actually good for us why can't they make us happy and the things that are bad for us, why can't they they show themselves to us as threats instead of like the things that we run to? Because we're human beings are powerful and we're smart and we're very resourceful and we're using all those skills to run in the exact wrong direction and we are absolutely convinced of the righteousness of our quest. We're absolutely convinced that we're going in the right direction. We got all the ideas. Well, here's the thing. This is where we go to step 11. Step 11 tells you what your goal should be. It says you should get up and you should ask the power or a power greater than yourself to release you from dishonest and self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance because our thinking will be on a higher plane when our, when we're cleared of wrong motives. When our goals each and every day is to like be as spiritual or spiritual as possible, be of maximum service to other people, to do all the things that we need to do for ourselves that, you know, they're not, they're not fun. These things don't always make us happy, but they will increase the quality of life that we happen to be living and it will allow us to remain sober. That is a sustainable goal system that will produce positive emotion. It won't produce negative emotion. It'll attract the right things to us. 
And then we don't fall into those traps of, you know, doing all those things that were, we, that are bad for us, but we somehow keep on doing them over and over and over again. You know, like, what is prayer? Prayer is a tool. Prayer is a tool to keep us on track. That aim, that spiritual aim, that fellowship, sponsorship, praying, meditating, the aim of being a spiritual person is the true aim. It is correct. It will produce well-being. What is prayer? Prayer is a tool that keeps us on track. Okay. Every time something in the environment triggers me into like a negative core belief or a negative emotion, or I want to react, you know, I want to berate someone. I want to be violent. I want to call in sick to work just because I simply don't want to go to work that day. It's like prayer is the thing that realigns me. It shifts my perceptual framework back into my primary objective. It shifts my goal system to a worthy goal system. It shifts everything for me so that I'm continuing to walk in the path that I've set for myself. Now, a lot of people say, when you're finally ready to recover, you can recover. Um, And it also makes me think of this saying, when the student is ready, the master will appear. It is in my belief that the master is always there. Everything you guys need to get sober and to live a better quality of life, it's all around you at all times. But here's the problem. Because your aims are somewhere else, it's hiding in the irrelevancy. As soon as you guys, through prayer, through meditation, through a force of will, decide that you want long-term sustainable recovery as an actual goal instead of just happiness, what will happen is that stuff that will help you will all manifest itself as something that is good tools in your field of awareness. And this is also simultaneously how the law of attraction works. All this stuff is already there. It just hides from you because it's irrelevant towards your current goal. You put your goal in the right spot and all those things will come to you. It's not magic. It's not frequencies. It's human beings using the God-given power of our own consciousness to manifest the reality that we want for ourselves. All right. Holy shit. I'm finally done explaining all that. So here's the deal, guys. Is the law of attraction real? 100%. Does prayer actually work? 100%. Is step 11 real and will it work? Obviously, 100%. In 12-step fellowships, they often say, like, you have to get rid of your self-will and your higher power is going to do everything for you and just rely on your higher power humbly and everything's going to go your way. And that's true. But there is a large self-will portion to any 12-step recovery program. And that's you guys actually need to make the decision to do things like pray, to do things like meditate. You actually have to, you know, consciousness will work itself out. God will work itself out in your guys' lives. But you have to be the ones that are willing to show up, do the prayer, do the meditation, jump on board with this program. Like God's going to go 90, you're going to go 10. God's going to go 90, you guys are going to go 10. If you're praying, if you're meditating, if you're striving to become greater than you currently are along spiritual lines, the laws that govern your emotions, truth, and your emotions will all synchronize to effectively lay out the red carpet and you guys can walk all the way down to sobriety. All right, guys, thank you for stopping by. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. I will see you next time.